Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to La Oficina Geek. My name is Dennis Davila, and today we have a very special guest. It's the director, John Wright, who directed the films Grabbers, Robot, o Robot Overlords, Tornented, and now the new upcoming horror movie, Unwelcome. John, how are you? Uh, very well, thanks. Awesome. Uh, so the film on Welcome started development back in 2020 when almost every production was put on hold. How was yeah. that experience? Yeah, well, it kind of, it helped us in a funny sort of way because they were looking for productions that didn't have thousands of extras. And our film is set in the middle of a very remote part of Ireland, so there aren't many people around. Um, so that it, it it actually helped us, and it helped probably helped us get green lit. I would imagine. So, what was the most difficult part of of doing this film back in twenty twenty? Uh, just having to wear a mask. Really, that was for oh. me. That was the it was a problem. You know, when you're directing and you're trying to communicate with people. Yes. What what I re what I realized very quickly is that a lot of your expression is below your eyes. You know. Yes. Yes. So if you make a joke or if you use humor as part of the way that you communicate with people, which I do, mm -hmm. um, it's quite hard to get put you know, put humor through a mask. It doesn't really right. work. Um, right. and yeah, it just made it tough to communicate clearly. I imagine. I can imagine. So this movie uh focuses it's the main, the main creature, right? It's from the Irish uh, mythological creature, the Fog Dari, better known as the Red Capes. Now, I know the uh, Red Caps, I'm sorry, the Red Caps. Yeah. Uh, I know the Irish have a lot of mythological creatures. Yes. Can you tell the audience a little bit of the story behind the Fog Dari and how do you manage to select the Red Caps above all the other creatures? Yeah, so our, our film is about violence. It's about a couple mm -hmm. who would describe themselves as pacifists, but they get put into a situation where they find it harder and harder to stick to their beliefs, you know. So we were looking for, I wanted to make something in Ireland and I wanted to make something fantastical. You know, the kind of things I enjoy are when you watch a, film or a television show that it's a window onto a world that you've never experienced and you never will experience. You know, so my favorite genres are fantasy and horror and science fiction. And so I wanted to find a mythological way into this story. And so I was reading a lot of Irish fairy tales and folk legends and um, looking back through history. And the thing that caught my attention were red caps because they are goblins who soak their caps in the blood of their victims and straight away that sounded to me like creatures that aren't guilty or ashamed of violence you know they actually are celebrating it and wearing it pride literally on their heads you know and it sounded very gruesome and what, I, what appealed to me is there's a stereotype but amongst Irish people of leprechauns you know so yes. when you see an Irish pub in other parts of the world, you know, whether it's Budapest or New York or Cape Town or, you know, I've been to all these pubs all around the world. They generally have a picture of a leprechaun who's a kind of cute, yeah. half, you know, pint-sized guy with a beard and a flute and a hat and, you know, seems like a friendly sort of jolly character. And red caps are not that. So what, <laughs> what, I, what I thought was fun was taking an Irish stereotype and sort of turning it over and p turning it on its head, really. So on the surface, you might think this is a film about cute little people. It's it's really not. It's a film about very nasty little people. It definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. That's actually a great description. <laughs> um, during this research, and now that you mentioned uh, the many creatures, right, from the Irish uh, culture, yeah. uh, during this research of these creatures how did you and the production team decided on the final design of the red caps well i had a um literally had a piece of paper i'm not the world's greatest artist but i can draw and mm -hmm. if, it, if i had any idea for a goblin i would draw it okay so they kind of i ended up with a, 
a page of goblins and you know that big noses small ears tiny eyes big teeth all kinds you know every variety really and what we did purposely was we didn't see these creatures as real actual um animals you know we saw them as half magical creatures so they sort of have a foot in the magical world and a foot in the real world and they live for a very long time and they're they're what I felt was if you had creatures in a wood and they were real in mm. today's that age with GPS and cameras on everybody that they would be found, you know, they would be discovered. Whereas if they're magical creatures that you can disappear and appear at will, you know, then they're not going to be found. And so that was part of the thinking. But what that also allowed us was if they're magical creatures, then they don't have to look like a family, you know, they can all be different. So we made them all look very different and they all have very specific personalities actually you know we've done a whole lot of very nerdy kind of detailed work on the personalities and the backstories of each goblin whether whether you can tell them apart i don't know uh, yeah actually uh, when i when i saw the film i know that these creatures they had all different designs yeah and i could tell them apart i remember one that had big beard so you know <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah. could tell that part, definitely. I think if you revisit the film and you watch it again, I think you'll probably notice this on the second or the third viewing, maybe, that they all are behaving in quite specific ways and they have, um, you know, they're all individuals. But I took my sheet of drawings and I gave it to a concept artist who is a far better artist than I can ever be. The guy called Paul, <laughs> Cat Paul Catley, who nice. works on big movies normally, big Marvel shows and, He, he worked on Star Wars and Doctor Strange and all kinds of huge, big um, films. And that's how he normally, what he normally does. But he likes working with me. He worked with me on Grabbers and Robot Overlords and also of this movie because he gets to work directly with me and he pretty much everything he does gets used. And, you know, he has a very different relationship. Whereas sometimes on something like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, he yeah. might be the one of 30 concept artists all working and they're all producing uh, several illustrations a day and it ends up in a huge pool and, you know, um, this is a very different thing. He's the only guy. And so he and I worked quite closely on that and he made these fantastic uh, illustrations which in three dimensions, which then he gave to a guy called Sean Harrison, who's a, a brilliant creature Uh, designer and makeup effects artist here, prosthetics guy, who's worked on, again, really big films like Harry Potter. He worked on pretty much all the Harry Potter films. Nice. He built some huge creatures for that show. And, and he turned them into masks, which were then worn by actors um, on, okay. on, on double-sized sets. So we okay. built sets that were twice the height of normal, of the actual place uh -huh. so for example when the goblin arrives at maya's house as he comes in through the french doors when he reaches up you see his shadowy hand reaching up to the the door of the french doors mm -hmm. uh, those doors are 12 feet tall mm, that's good that's good yeah. so he's actually uh uh he's relatively short but not that short he's five foot five that guy i think uh -huh. and But in our world, he looks half that size. Yes, but with the door, it's 12 feet tall. Well, it makes the perfect, uh, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Exactly. And that was inspired by a movie called Cat's Eye. I don't know if you remember that film from the 80s. Which was uh, yeah, definitely. A yeah. Stephen King adaptation. And they used a kind of similar-ish thing where they had a, a guy in a costume dressed as a goblin mm -hmm. running around on a giant yes. I mean, it really was a giant set, that one. It was yes. um, much bigger than double height. I think it was, I don't know, uh, giant, you know, and he, he climbs on a giant roller skate and climbs up a bedpost that's absolutely enormous. And that always stayed with me. I thought that looks really cool. It's a very interesting way of doing it. Yes, and now that you mentioned the practical effects, uh, I know that some CGI uh, was used in the movie. Yeah, but how much of the design of the red caps was CGI and what was used with practical effects? You already mentioned that you had actors with masks 
Yeah, but the where the expression CGI or, or yes, what the, the, so what we did was um, we photographed these actors mm -hmm. actually doing everything, but obviously the the masks themselves were static, um, mm -hmm. and we also motion captured an actor called Rick Warden, who's an old friend of mine, and he played every the face of every goblin and the voice. Okay. Oh, okay. He would, he would perform it. And then that motion capture data was used to animate the faces of the goblins. Right. So for me, you get the best of both worlds because one of the things, one of the curses of the movies that I know and love from my childhood was I love the practical effects, but when you get into a close up, often the faces are quite rubbery and they're not very expressive. Yeah. Even the very best animatronics. Yes, definitely. Don't look real. The eyes don't look real. So we have very expressive faces that are actually yes basically doing exactly what another what an actor did mm -hmm. uh, we also have the the weight and the tangible you know the the the, the full size goblins you, they will they are actually there and they are actually interacting with their surroundings and you can sort of tell that i think that that's one of the negatives about cg and obviously there's some amazing cg around now but sometimes with creatures i feel when you go to the wide shot and you see them moving around and fighting and jumping off things and running and they just look a bit, the gravity doesn't look quite right. They don't quite it like they're really in their surroundings and you can sort of sense that it was, nothing was photographed. Yes. Yeah. So you can definitely tell what there is CGI and then somebody actually in, in the costume. Right. Well, um, I, I really like uh, the, uh, how some scenes felt like we were inside a fairy tale yeah. when they first arrived at the house and everything, the colors that, that you guys used, everything, it felt like a fairy tale. Did you always had this on your mind or was, or it, was it something that it developed during filming? Yeah, very much. It was, it was something from the beginning. I felt that this is a, a dark fairy tale for adults. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, fairy tales are, um, you know, in the modern era, particularly, are traditionally for children. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a shame in a way because I love the imagery and the atmosphere that you get with a fairy tale, and I, I wanted to make something that was specifically for adults. So, just to be clear, this is not a good film for children. I don't think. No, uh, no. <laughs> not, but um, not that. Uh, yeah. It, it, very much has all that imagery and we tried to push it so that it didn't feel particularly once you leave London and you go to Ireland that it doesn't feel um, completely real but it feels like heightened and it has almost the quality of a dream and and of course we use all those images that you get from fairy tales so she goes into the deep dark wood you know like Hansel and Gretel and she finds the little house and mm -hmm. all of the things that happen I think are uh, very reminiscent of fairy tales. We borrowed heavily from all of that, and it's extremely purposeful. Yeah. Good, good, good. It was. I, I quickly got it when I saw the this inside. You, this really feels like a fairy tale. So that's that's a really good job with that. My final question will be: What's what's? Do you have any final message before the release of Unwelcome? Uh, I just hope. We designed a film that I liken to a roller coaster ride. So I think you have the ascent where you're going up the roller coaster and you can look around and enjoy the views and the beautiful Irish countryside. And there's a slow, slow build. And eventually, I would say the final third of the film, we go over and we drop. And I think, um, you know, because you've seen it, but I think, the, you know, it's pretty thrilling and intense and exciting and a lot of fun. And yeah, I, I think there's things to think about as well. I think it's very much in the vein of the modern horror in that it's thought provoking. We talk a little bit about what it's like to live in the modern world and it's maybe not, not as simplistic and two dimensional as some of the creature features that inspired the movie. Mm -hmm. But I think the are great fun and uh, yeah, there's, um, I hope people enjoy it and have as much fun watching it as we did making it. Great. Great. Thank you so much for your time, John. I appreciate uh, everything that you're doing. I wish you very well on this 
uh, project and every single thing that you do in the future. So thank you for your time one more time. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. It was good.